There we go. Sorry. A little bit about us and where we started this journey. So November 2017, we've already heard where the ICO market has been and was at that stage. But during 2017, our, uh, our, co our CEO, Carlos Domingo, was a co-founder of a venture capital fund called Spice VC. And what Carlos and uh, his team had discovered that in 2017, they wanted to actually fully tokenize the VC fund and do it in a fully compliant way with all securities regulations. And so they set up in 2017, uh, securitized. Headquartered in San Francisco, uh, engineering team in Tel Aviv, offices in uh, the East Coast in New York, London, product in Madrid, and we're just also now expanding into Asia as well. We're backed by some of the biggest players in the blockchain space as well. So Carlos is, is, is here, and, and as Julie mentioned, she's, she's known both Carlos and Jamie for, for some time. And the story really around the evolution of Securitize and the demand and market for this technology was really driven from what they had created in Spice VC. So not finding anywhere else uh, in the world to, to, uh, to be able to deliver uh, on this, to have a full DS protocol compliant layer across all securities regulations was something that they built. So why is it important? What are issuers looking for when they come and speak with us? One of the biggest drivers is really access to capital. Today, access to capital is, is, is quite a, a huge uh, consideration and concern for issuers that are, that are, that are needing to, to, to raise that money. And um, where do we see most, um, most activity? Private offerings, of course, bonds and syndicated lending. If you look at the IPO and the number of IPOs that are in place as a, as, a, as a means of raising capital, you'll see that they're a much later stage in the company's journey and there are much higher valuations. So access to capital is key, but it is a business that is flawed and has significant problems, not only in terms of expense of obtaining that, but also in terms of liquidity. So the other inefficiencies with these markets and particularly raising capital is the long time for settlement, there are data silos, many individuals and collaboration required across various internal and external teams, quite often a manual process that uh, inevitably involves some level of error. Of course, the expense consideration. And while fractional ownership is possible, one of the points made in the earlier, uh, one of the earlier presentations around access to a wide global pool of investors has not been possible. And equally on the investor side, access to a diversification of uh, assets and other instruments for investment has also been restricted. So this would be very familiar to anyone who's, who's been playing in the blockchain space. And we believe, as, as to many and most, I think, that blockchain technologies are perfect to address these issues, providing that record of ownership, uh, solving that multi-stakeholder problem, giving that uh, decentralized collaboration and information sharing platform, enabling full transparency, audibility, traceability, and of course, instant settlement, which will have a, a massive cost impact as well. So an interesting uh, quote from Robert Grief Greifield of the former chairman and CEO of NASDAQ. And interestingly, this statement was made in 2017. So um, he had stated that 100% of the stocks and bonds trading on Wall Street today could be tokenized. And in five years, 100% of the stocks and bonds on Wall Street will be tokenized. Now, 2017 statement, really interesting. We certainly believe in this statement. We do think the time frame is quite aggressive, but we certainly feel that we're on the road and indeed the path to that adoption. So let's talk a little bit about digital securities. They've been named by many different acronyms, STO, security token offering, digital securities, and the market is still in many ways be becoming educated around what these are. But ultimately, the ability for a digital uh, security to have a smart contract that sits alongside it um, enables a full layer of compliance uh, with, that, uh, with that token and with that issuance. Compliance is built in to the smart contracts that sit alongside a token. Those are programmable, so they're self-executing, and for dividends and buybacks in the life cycle of this token, that's also possible. The liquidity aspect, again, we've heard this is a common thread today. The liquidity aspect of the access to a 24-7, 365 marketplace is really a huge attraction. Now, of course, the reality is, because this industry is still in its infancy, 
the liquidity aspect is not yet there, but again, we expect it to be. There's some level of liquidity. There's already some level of trading across the regulated exchanges that have integrated with our platform, for example, but it's smaller number. It's the tip of the iceberg, if you will, in terms of what is happening on that path to adoption. Fractional ownership, again, who can access the likes of an Aspen real estate transaction? Who can access an equity stake in a large corporate, for example? Fractional ownership, while possible today, is really difficult to get out of that position. And also, um, it's just really not available to a large portion of the investor community. Transparency, immutability, efficiency, and time saving, these are all very common threads across all blockchains, of course. So if you think of Securitize, I'm bumping into the platform. Uh, if you think of Securitize as a technology provider, but ultimately we're, we're providing an end-to-end -end platform and our DS protocol for issuing, managing, and enabling liquidity for the security tokens. Now, we're not an exchange, we're not a broker-dealer, we're not a custodian, we're not an advisory arm, we are the technology provider. But what we do is that we integrate these partners into our, uh, pr into our platform, and they use and adopt our protocol such that when an issuer is coming, not only can they ensure compliance in the primary market, but also through the secondary market and their trading and during the life cycle of their issuance. So if you look at the, the disks here uh, on, the, on the screen, an issuer will come to us and say, uh, I have a project, I'd like you to help us create a uh, compliant digital security offering. So we will enable that to happen. Uh, we will work with that issuer to create a web portal, and behind that web portal, uh, you will find then our technology is, is sitting uh, there. An investor will come into that web portal and go through the journey of AML, KYC, accreditation, and the relevant level of qualification that that investor, whether accredited, whether a qualified investor, retail investor, whatever their remit, they will go through that process. And the DS protocol ensures that only those who can participate, both from a securitization perspective, from a securities regulation perspective, but also from the parameters of your own transaction, that only those who can participate will participate. So we also then go through, obviously, the documentations on the platform, the creation of the wallet itself, the issuance of the security token, and the investment funding, both in terms of fiat and crypto. So what happens, so it's the primary. And that's where, where really the significant uh, portion is for, for, for the starting point, if you will. What's happening in the secondary market? We already, we already heard from, from Hugh uh, on, on the exchanges and the movement of uh, crypto exchanges globally. What's happening today with, uh, with compliant digital securities and the transfer of those is that licenses are required to be in place. Now, there's only a handful of those licenses actually in place today globally. Um, there are three ATSs in the US who've integrated with our platform in order that issuances on our platform issuers on our platform can actually trade those securities uh, today. We see over the next six to 12 months, well, the, within, within this year, actually, there'll be a significant number of additional regulated exchanges uh, that will come into play. Those will integrate with our platform. That opens the entire market in terms of secondary trading and in terms of liquidity, the much needed uh, element of uh, these, uh, these security uh, token uh, uh, tokenizations. The life cycle piece is really important. So again, if you're looking at a, uh, sorry, on the secondary trading piece, the other component there for new investors coming in, that layer of compliance feeds through into the issuer. The issuer can see real lifetime cap table of what's happening on their issue during the life of, of, of that issuance. The life cycle piece is basically around economic rights, governance attaching to that token, what happens in terms of distribution, uh, captive management uh, I mentioned already, but also then generally corporate actions, communications between issuer and investor. All of that is happening in one place. So it is really the end-to-end -end platform issuing, managing, enabling liquidity. That's what we do. So we can't do this alone. And we're not a custodian. We're not a liquidity partner. We're not a broker dealer, we're not advisory or legal. We partner with these teams and we've done that significantly and we've done that across the many transactions that we have on the platform already today and continue to build out those relationships as additional uh, exchanges become regulated for the purpose of transferring these, uh, these, uh, these securities. So where are we today? Again, on this road to adoption, we're the market leader, which is fantastic. We're the only company in the industry with security tokens issued and trading, which is powered by a digital securities protocol on the blockchain. 
Incidentally, we, uh, all of those issued today have been on the Ethereum blockchain, but we are blockchain agnostic. We're working on some projects now which include Hyperledger and a number of other blockchains as well. Who has issued, who's trading, what are those pending? What does this look like? So from a early adopter perspective, and if you look across the, 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 the list here, you'll have a number of venture capital funds uh, you'll also have a real estate transaction, a uh, full revenue share of operating businesses and pure equity in operating businesses. And then a number of those VCs are actually trading today across those regulated exchanges that I've mentioned already. We have 19 STO, but actually that number is close to now to 30 um, uh, as of uh, the end of June. Uh, so we have 30 plus STOs which are now uh, launched are in pending status and we cannot uh, list who they are because they're uh, actively uh, live and that would be seen as advising. Uh, so we, we, cannot, we cannot do that. But some of the most frequent questions I get asked when I, when I speak with clients around, you know, previous uh, experience, who's live on the platform, who's, who's used the platform, the, the, the questions are, are familiar in terms of, you know, share with us the size of the, the issuance, for example. So typically around uh, 15 to 35 million issuance across these, um, across these uh, issuers. Uh, we've just raised in excess of 200 million uh, for these uh, issuers. They've these issuers have raised just in excess of 200 million across 1,500 investors globally. So that will also uh, include accredited and uh, a number of, a uh, small number of retail as well. A little bit of a deeper dive into just two of these. One's a VC fund, and again, it'll be relevant for some of you in the room who might be considering uh, looking at this as an option uh, for your VC, uh, for your VC fund. Um, but uh, but Spice VC, I think, is a good example because it was the original, uh, the original fund which really adopted and built this technology, this DS protocol. So it's the first fully tokenized VC fund. It's the fourth ever security token. First uh, token issued on, on, the, uh, on a compliant security token issuance platform, which evolved into uh, Securitize. And of course, it was the first fund focusing on the tokenization space, the first security token to trade in a regulated platform, which is the Open Finance Wor Network, where a number of them are trading now today. And really the first security token fund to enable holders to a direct share of net exits. In terms of minimum investment, it was 50,000, offering size 15 million. Uh, the issuer invests proceeds in, in, in startups, and the deal structure was a, was a private Reg D and Reg S offering equity ownership in the LP fund and direct share of net assets. These would be some of the questions that I get asked quite frequently in terms of what does it look like before we get into the, the deeper level of that. The other case study, which is very interesting because of the sheer uh, interest, I think, in, in, uh, in real estate and the application of this technology into the, the real estate world. So Rani, of course, you know, referred to the application of this technology uh, in, in his project specifically. We have a series of other projects uh, in real estate which are also uh, coming through right now. But the most, I guess, recognized first uh, in market was certainly the Aspen, uh, the Aspen coin and the issuance of the token that represented the St. Regis Aspen Colorado Resort. So again, a minimum investment, 10,000, 10, uh, 10, offering size of 18 million. Now, interesting with, with, uh, with Aspen, and this is also the case with many real estate players who come through. They'll issue th uh, a digital security STO only for a portion of the to total amount they may need to raise. And that's a, a test case, for example, for them. They'll want to test the market, dip their toe in, see how it goes, and then bring in the rest of the portfolio. And that's, that's what's happening with uh, Aspen, for example, today. Uh, but that's also the, the case with many other uh, issuers in, in the real estate space as well. Um, so it was private, uh, private Reg D issuance, again, indirect fragmented equity ownership for accredited investors. And, and again, I think the trend that we've seen uh, presently has been a move you know, obviously Aspen is such a uh, famous landmark. Most people, I think globally, you'd safe to say, know it. Um, should know it, I guess. Um, but, but, but certainly the, the movement that we're also seeing is from, uh, from kind of trophy type property through to, you know, commercial real estate, which are, you know, which are, which are kind of uh, less uh, of, of a trophy status and, and more business as usual type status. That's quite interesting. But the, the present day has really seen that application of this technology into venture capital funds, LP interest and VC funds, 
some hedge funds as well, of course, uh, real estate, and then in, in operating businesses who are uh, able to, to, to have a, an equity uh, offering for their, for their, uh, for their uh, investors. More interestingly, in the past, I'd say two months, because again, this, this changing world is very rapid. The industry itself is m still very much in its infancy, but what we've seen in the past few months now is the adaptation of this technology in other areas, media, pharmaceuticals, medicine, for example. So there is a real change and shift beyond what we have seen already. These are the early adopters, the guys that, that, I've, uh, that I've mentioned on the, on the slide previously. Uh, and they have all issued using the public blockchain, Ethereum, real estate, venture funds, equity, revenue streams. And then, of course, where is this going? Institutional customers. How does this gap between early adopters, those having a real appetite for using this technology uh, in, 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 in real time now, how does it trans transcend or transport into the real investment grade institutional level uh, customer as well? Quite often what we see in the discussions that we have and some of the projects we're working on with uh, some of the, the larger global players is that they'll want to look at the permissioned-based blockchain. And so, for example, one of the uh, projects that we're working on with IBM uh, and Hyperledger is exactly that. So we're working with the IBM Treasury, looking at an 82 trillion fixed uh, debt uh, income uh, uh, market, and working with a number of global banks and players, including the regulator, the clearing houses, the custodians, to basically bring and use this technology in a way that makes the process of fixed income and particular instruments within this a much more effective, cost-effective and efficient way to, to move forward. So that's really uh, an overview. Hopefully, it's, I've managed to keep it relatively short. I did take out some slides, so I wouldn't pain you too much. But I'd certainly welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Have a seat. You know, it's, it's fascinating. But um, you know, I guess one of the things I, I wondered was, could you do your job if you had not been a lawyer and such a successful lawyer? Because um, you know, Jamie and Carlos told me part of the reason why they wanted you on the team is you've been so good at your job that that was so essential. It's all really about legal frameworks and corporate architecture. And I mean, that that's just, you couldn't do it if you didn't understand it. So thank you for, for, for the question. Um, you know, I think that my background is, is, is different in this space, for sure. Uh, so while I'm a qualified lawyer, UK lawyer, I've actually spent eight years in banking as well, okay. and, and now uh, three and a half uh, years in technology companies. But during that entire time, it's been very focused on debt capital markets in particular. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my interest in financial services, financial industry, adoption of technology to change and disrupt that mm -hmm. is really the driver for me. Um, and, and seeing the, um, the nature of the structures as a, as a lawyer, so mm -hmm. it, it particularly on the, on the, on the debt uh, side, um, and the application, potential application of this technology to that industry is so huge that yeah. that's really where um, I see the, the, the synergy, uh, if you will, coming into play with the technology team, with, the, with, with, right. with Carlos, with, with Jamie and, and, and the team. So, you know, I think it's helpful in any uh, mm -hmm. guise mm -hmm. of, of life, but particularly helpful when the regulatory landscape uh, is, is still very, um, very vague in many, uh, in, in many ways. The parameters are not as clear in some jurisdictions as in others. So having the ability to understand what they are, trying to stay ahead of that, work with the regulators as well, right, right. work with the uh, with, the, with the, 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 the legal teams who are actually uh, drafting this, uh, the, some of these uh, changes in regulation is also fundamental. So yeah. I, do, I do think that it's been a, a helpful uh, background for sure in my journey so far, but also the banking element and seeing the massive inefficiencies, particularly in a post-issuance scenario um, and the adoption of this technology there is also very significant. The relationship between Spice VC and Securitas is, a, is also very unique, isn't it? That, that helps both businesses because you can see the, you know, you can understand the real implications of it for venture. Um, and that gave you a huge insight in what was needed on the technology. Um, but I mean, there's other people technically that are kind of in the peer group to Spice VC. Is there anybody that's in your peer group? So uh, I think in, in terms of Spice VC and really 
the, the team, Carlos and the team, identifying specifically the opportunity in market. So mm -hmm. they could identify a pain point that they had in <coughs> market mm -hmm. and they address that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they built this technology and then it evolved, of course, into the business that we are today mm -hmm. in terms of securitized because of the demand. But that interconnection between a, an offering that was driven from a, uh, a market need by this mm -hmm. VC fund mm -hmm. has been massively important because other mm -hmm. players in market have then come to recognize that they also want to ensure that they're able to progress in the same way. Yeah. We have, of course, you know, competitors in market in terms of, 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 of platform, um, but, uh, but that connection between the experience that we have, the execution that we have, and, and the really the kind of uh, first mover advantage in market has been significant. Excellent. Any questions for Bridge right here in the front? Kevin? Kevin, we've got a microphone uh, whizzing over there. So um, SEC hasn't really approved any exchanges. Well, maybe one vaguely, but uh, what is your, do you have a preferred s s uh, exchange? Uh, Binance could be one, T0. There are a whole list of uh, exchange, you know, so-called wannabe exchanges, but uh, do you have a preferred uh, exchange that you have in mind. Sure, and so, so the term exchange, uh, I, I suppose, is, is something which um, can also be uh, used in different ways, but the, the approved uh, marketplaces are ATSs, so they're approved by the SEC as alternative trading s systems in the US. Uh, Open Finance is one, Shares Post is the second, and T0 is actually the third, which is currently now been integrated with our platform. So those are the ATSs that have been, have been approved by the SEC for the purpose of the transfer of, um, of compliant digital securities uh, in the US. And it's an MTF equivalent in Europe, for example. So you'll see a number of MTFs who are lining up now with the regulators to become regulated. There's quite a list that is expected during the course of this year, you know, by the end of uh, 2019. It's a whole series of acronyms, clearly, that we're all gonna have to learn, or at least I do. Uh, other questions for Bruges? Uh, I don't want to uh, announce things that uh, haven't been announced and so forth, but you guys are, are really kind of cleaning up on the capital front, aren't you? I mean, it's going well. The money is there to back this kind of proposition. Um, clearly, we haven't announced it. <laughs> um, Yes, and I think you know that that is true. So, so from a financing and, and capital perspective, there is a, a massive interest, obviously, in what we're doing. But, but I think it's also if you look at the, um, I guess, the journey. And mm -hmm. again, we we talked mm -hmm. kind of theme on this is very much road to adoption. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, because it's much bigger than than, than just the, the the number of uh, transactions that we have already uh, on the platform right now. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at some of the big projects that we're working mm -hmm. on. Uh, some of the big integrations with well-established global names on the exchange side, together with global banks who are integrating this technology, that's mm -hmm. when it becomes very, very interesting. And we as a company are progressing along that line quite significantly as well, which in turn leads to this interesting and, and attractive um, element of, of, of capital. Twelve, 12 months from now, you come back. Uh, we're in uh, Juan Lepin, Malaga, uh, wherever we are for the FTE, and what's the state of play? You update uh, your new friends on Securitize and what's happened. I would absolutely love to, and I promise next time it won't be uh, on the end of something. I'll ensure to block out the day <laughs> for the entire stay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, delighted to, again, have the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you all for your time as well. Much appreciated. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you.